what we found is that actually families who had access to more hours of treatment, particularly in the autism group, actually were also more likely to be using complementary treatments. So that was kind of a surprise and, and I think really interesting. It was also correlated with higher education levels. So parents with higher education levels are also more likely not only to be using conventional treatments, but are also more likely to be using complementary and alternative treatments. They are also more likely to be using sort of a subset of these therapies that we classified in our study as, as potentially more risky or invasive, which required, say, injections, or that had been disproven, that there is actually quite a bit of evidence to suggest that these are not effective treatments for autism. And so those were all correlated, actually, with, with higher education levels. One of the things that is really important, and I think our study, we really tried to emphasize this, is that it is important that we are able to have these conversations with families and as best we can as, as healthcare providers, walk them through making some of these decisions in terms of balancing what we know, if there's evidence that it might be efficacious, that maybe there's some biological plausibility or some mechanisms that make sense to try, as well as what do we know about the risk factors. And so there's trying to help families walk through this. What do we know about potential efficacy? Does it, does it make sense? Is there any, even if it's anecdotal evidence, or is there, is there any scientific evidence from previous studies? And then what do we know about potential risk factors? And, and then each family will have a different way that they make those decisions about what they see as the risk-benefit ratio. And I think making sure that they're clear about that decision-making process and that we're open to having that conversation. And I think for a lot of families I know, they don't feel safe with their healthcare professionals saying, well, I want to try this. Sometimes the response they get is, well, that's crazy or, you know, you shouldn't do that. But I think we need to help parents make the best decisions they, that they can. And I think we have to be willing as healthcare professionals to say, well, let me look at the information that you're looking at and then let's have a discussion about what you and I, how we both interpret this information. It may be that I interpret it a little bit differently than you do. Maybe we interpret it the same, but the decision making is, a, is what we want to talk about and what might be the risks. And then how can I help you, if you decide you want to try this, establish some baseline measurements and then track what we think uh, the effects will be and are we making progress and, and continue to do that as we go forward to make sure that it's, we can document whether it's having an effect or not and that we can also follow something that might be unsafe and have a way to measure that. Well, we clearly need more evidence to help families make these decisions. So I think the clinical trials that are going on and I think studies like the CHARGE study who are looking at what do we understand about the underlying etiologic pathways. So it's clear that there are multiple causes of autism. Clearly there are many, many causes for developmental disabilities. Uh, some of them are genetic, some of them we, we don't know. Clearly we need to be helping families as we gather this evidence be making these decisions as best we can. I think one of the things particularly for families who have children on the autism spectrum is that a lot of CAM therapy is actually not so much targeted at core symptoms of autism, but on some of the other associated symptoms, such as GI symptoms. So the most common um, CAM treatments that we found in our study were dietary supplements, and in autism, the dietary changes that were most common was a gluten and uh, casein-free diet. So, you know, I think that most of the time families who were choosing those, that, that diet, had children with GI symptoms. And so I think we have to just be very clear again as health professionals that when kids with autism come in and they have chronic diarrhea, chronic constipation, that we shouldn't just think, oh, that's just part of their autism. 
we need to sort of figure out why do they have chronic diarrhea or why do they have constipation? Is it something we could address through changing their diet? Is it something that we need to investigate in terms of what's the underlying cause for that, just like we would with any, any child who came in with chronic GI symptoms? So to take that seriously and not think that's just part of the autism. So again, I think that's sometimes we need to think about what is it that the parents think is the target for the CAM treatments that they're, that they're using. And it may not be core symptoms of autism.